Welcome back to the lineup. We're going to look now at a story from the Middle East. Nearly one year after the terror attack on his home in the West Bank village of Duma, five-year-old Ahmed Dawabshe, the sole family survivor from the attack, has finally been released from hospital. Ahmed's parents and one-year-old brother were killed in the fire, which, according to Israeli prosecutors, was started by two Jewish extremists. Our correspondent Mohammed Al Qasim accompanied the family today and brought back this story. Almost one year to the day, the sole survivor of an arson attack that killed his entire family, Ahmed Dawabsi was released from the hospital last Friday and is among family now. The firebomb attack, allegedly committed by an extremist Jewish group, killed his mother, father, and brother. Ahmed, who turned six this week, spent his first few days in Duma with his grandparents. His uncle Nasser said coming home helps in his nephew's treatment. Thank God Ahmad is in good spirits. He wanted to come home and doesn't want to stay in the hospital. One full year is enough away from his village and relatives. Being here will help speed up Ahmed's treatment. Ahmed suffered burns on more than 60% of his tiny body. He spent close to a month in the intensive care unit. When he came home, he asked about his parents and his little brother Ali. Yes, we talked with Ahmed, but before we told him, we had a feeling something happened, because none of them came to visit him during his stay. He says my mother, father and brother are in heaven. Ahmed underwent a number of surgeries. He always has on compression shirts, almost like a bodysuit, due to the severe burns sustained in the attack. He must also avoid direct sunlight. Ahmed's grandfather, Hussein Dawabshi, spoke highly of the doctors here at Tel HaShomer Hospital, saying the staff treated his grandchild in the best way possible. What happened to Ahmed made him an introvert. He keeps to himself and loves to play games featuring his favorite hero, Cristiano Ronaldo. Dr. Asher Brzezilai, head of the pediatric infectious unit, said when Ahmed arrived here, his condition was critical. When he comes here, he was in 60 degrees burns. Usually those kids do not survive. And actually we have to fight for the first months, okay, for his survival. We weren't sure whether he will survive or not. It will take time. This is not the last time that we see him. He will come in very often, all right, for years. The first stage of Ahmed's treatment in the hospital is over, and doctors released him to his grandfather, Hussein Dawabshe. Ahmed is now living in Duma, just a few meters from where his family was murdered. But even though he is now in the comfort of a new home, Ahmed's journey to full recovery may take years. Mohammed Al Qasim, I24 News, Tel Hashumir Hospital, Tel Aviv. And Mohammed Al Qasim, who brought us this report, is actually with us in studio. Thank you for joining me. So, Mohammed, let's start with his medical condition today and uh, an expectation for a full recovery. Great progress. I've been with, on this case and this uh, I've reported on it from day one. The great progression that Ahmed's made in the last year uh, gives you, uh, according to his doctors, uh, basically he will recover. It may take years. Some doctors said that it may take up to eight years with, uh, with, tr by, with treatment before he is fully recovering. But to see him walk again, which a few months ago he couldn't even walk and put any pressure on his feet or his body, it's a great, great uh, uh, thing to, to hear and see. Uh, he's back to his uh, natural environment. He's back to seeing his friends and his family, and he feels a lot better now. His spirit is very high, and his self-esteem is great. And I think that being at home will impact him very, very positively. And the doctors mentioned that for the first month, they're really fighting for his life. And though he's been released, he will be seeing the hospital on a very, uh, uh, on a regular occasion yes, every yes. week. What, what's expected as far as his recovery and visiting the hospital? He will be visiting the hospital at least once a week. He will go there for rehab and checkups and also some, uh, some operations every once uh, in a while when needed to uh, treat his, uh, his skin. He, as I said, this may take up to eight years. Some, some doctors have told me also today that it may take up uh, to 10 years. But I think at the end of the day, Ahmed is on the right path to, uh, to recovery with the help of his uh, medical staff as well as his uh, family. And final question, Mohammed, you've been covering this. You said from day one, this is a very touching story to say the least. What was the experience like for you covering this and from the moment they were really fighting for his life to the moment he's released? Listen, we don't try to attach ourselves to any of the stories 
stories that we cover. But when you see a little kid who was five years uh, old a year ago and now he's six, and to see him fighting for his life, more than 60 to 70 percent of his, his body suffered from severe burn. And to see him today, he knows me when I go into the room. He knows me when he smiles when, uh, when I talk to him. And to see him walk again, to see him uh, eat and drink and actually talk about normal things that other kids talk about, it just makes you very, very happy. Seeing him back in his normal environment is definitely probably the best thing that uh, could be said at this point. Mohamed Al Qasim, thank you very much for bringing us this story. And we're going to stay in the Middle East and move to neighboring uh, Israel. Elora Zaria, the soldier standing trial for killing a subdued Palestinian assailant, is cross examined today in military court, where he calls his commanding officer's testimony a lie. I-24 News senior defense correspondent Shai Benary spent the day at the Jaffa military court. The cross-examination of Sergeant Elora Azaria, the IDF soldier charged with manslaughter over the killing of a disarmed Palestinian assailant, began Monday. The early focus was on a new claim brought forth by Azaria in the past few days, in which he said his commander, Major Tom Naaman, slapped him twice on the face and shouted at him shortly after the shooting. But in a video shown in court Monday from a military police interrogation on the day of the shooting, Azaria was asked if his officer was angry at him. He is heard hesitantly answering no, with no mention of slaps. Furthermore, the prosecution pointed out that Major Tom Naaman was not asked about any slaps by the defense during his own cross-examination last month. Azaria said he only remembered the slaps later on. Under pressure from the prosecution, the soldier also admitted that in a situation involving a suspected explosive, one should act to clear away people from the scene and not shoot. Azaria said he decided to open fire because he felt he had no time and made a split-second decision. We asked the defense if this was not an admission of misconduct. No, because if you watch the video, you can see he had a fraction of a second. And though the prosecution has not really addressed it, you can see that during the shooting incident itself, he stops himself for a second, sees the danger and shoots. The prosecution also cast doubt on Sergeant Azaria's statement that he had never been briefed on what to do in case of a suspected explosive. The soldier said only that he was instructed to act according to the principle of, quote, if there is any doubt, then there is no doubt. Azaria added he shot in order to remove any doubt in question. Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman said Monday that politicians should not decide the fate of Sergeant Azaria, but some of his statements echoed those of the soldier in court Monday. It's easy to talk here, but when you're in the field, in the midst of an incident or a battle, things are more complicated. It's not sitting in an air-conditioned room. Azaria's cross-examination will continue on Tuesday. And our correspondent Shai Benary is at the Jaffa courtroom. Shai, what can you update us at this point? Yes, a number of other interesting points that have come up uh, throughout the second day of Elor Azaria's uh, interrogation here, his cross-examination really, uh, before the court. One of these points was actually a hypothetical situation that was presented to him in which supposedly a terrorist were to come up and surrender with his arms raised. He was asked if he would also shoot towards the head. Uh, Laura Azaria said that under the exact same circumstances, meaning also with shouts warning of a, a suspected explosive with a, with, a, with a jacket that was deemed suspicious, he would also choose to shoot towards the head uh, to neutralize, so to speak. He was also asked regarding a certain quote that has been attributed to him where he supposedly said in the immediate aftermath of the shooting, the terrorist should die or deserves to die. He said that he did not remember actually saying that quote. He's not sure he actually said the sentence, but that if he did, the sentence was incomplete. If he did indeed say it, the sentence was incomplete. He meant that if a terrorist uh, uh, was actually presenting an actual threat to the lives of people in his surroundings, then yes, they should die or deserves to die. But of course, he did indeed uh, uh, insist that he did not actually remember saying this sentence. The testimony of Elora Azar is also expected to uh, continue at least until uh, Tuesday, perhaps even until Wednesday. Thanks, Shai. And criminal lawyer Ronen Samalowski joins us now in studio. Ronen, thank you for joining us. Conflicting you. reports by El Orazare himself calling uh, his commander a liar and changing some of his testimonies. How will this affect the trial? It could affect the trial dramatically. The problem with numerous versions leads to contradictions between those versions, which will be probably used by the prosecution to try and undermine his creditability and reliability. And can you maybe tell us a little bit about the differences between trial in a military court versus a civilian court? 
Actually, the procedures are quite similar. Uh, military police is investigating. Once they have concluded the evidence, prosecution indicted the accused, and then he has to answer to court, to martial court, uh, whether he's guilty or not guilty. In this case, Azaria uh, pleaded not guilty. His court has begun, his trial has begun with the case of prosecution, and now we're at the case of uh, defense. He's actually the head uh, witness of the defense, and the numerous versions he has uh, showed, three or four, will probably uh, be effective on <laughs> his situation. And the prosecutors did today indeed uh, tell him that he is lying, something that is very dramatic in a courtroom, I understand, maybe uh, not completely rare, but a dramatic thing to tell your witness, that he is indeed lying. Now, the media coverage that is affecting and really heightening the hype around this trial, how do you believe this is affecting the trial itself behind these doors? It's actually a question that rises up uh, on each trial that has a media coverage, and the judges will have to put it aside and focus only or their professionalism, and I'm sure they will be able to do that. And now uh, about the, the court, um, maybe looking into his age, he said that he was under pressure at the time uh, of the actual uh, shooting. He says he didn't feel comfortable afterwards. He was traumatized. He didn't remember some of the, uh, the, the initial reactions. He didn't remember his uh, commander who even hit him, he says, today in right. trial. Will the court take into consideration the young age of Elor Azaria, being just 18 years old, and the fact that he claims he was under such immense pressure? We do know that Hebron is a very high-pressure uh, area where, where soldiers are on very high alert. How much of this will play in, and will the, the, uh, will the judges be in any way sensitive to these cold facts? Yes. As a matter of fact, we have to bear in mind that Laura Zaya is 19 years old. A few years ago, the Supreme Court has determined a new determination that is called an adult juvenile, which addresses normally uh, young people at the age from 18 to 21, 22. Biologically and physically, they're adults. They hold for their actions, but sometimes psychologically and mentally, they're still juveniles. So that range of ages is taken under consideration in cases that he will be indicted. Well, and Samorowski, thank you very much for weighing in on this trial, which, of course, we'll continue to follow closely. Thank you. And we move now to Turkey. Ten days since the failed coup attempt, detention warrants are issued to 42 journalists. Turkey is now looking at foreign influences, stating its plan to remove some ambassadors in the aftermath. Defense correspondent Anna Ehrenheim with the report. Turkey's nationwide purge of state institutions continues, with the removal of foreign ministry staff from their posts. This latest phase of the controversial crackdown has also seen authorities issue arrest warrants for over 40 journalists. Turkey blames the failed coup attempt on U.S.-based Turkish cleric Fethullah Gulen, and the country's foreign minister has warned that ties between Washington and Ankara would be impacted if the United States did not extradite him. This will not have any positive impacts on our relations. It won't help the U.S. either. We are trying to balance the extradition process. But we are also observing the reactions of our citizens. I don't want to talk about bad scenarios. But if the U.S. doesn't hand Gulen over, then it will affect our relations. But it's not only ties with the United States that are at risk. Turkey runs the risk of not joining the European Union following calls to reinstate the death penalty. I believe that Turkey, in its current state, is not in a position to become a member anytime soon and not even over a longer period. But uh, Kavosoglu was not phased by Juncker's comments, defyingly saying that Juncker was not the boss of Turkey and that any threat to Turkey would backlash on the EU. Erdogan has been cracking down on thousands of people in the judiciary, education, military and civil service after the failed military coup. Firing, suspending or investigating over 76,000 people. Another 20,000 people have been detained. And we're now joined by Laura Patel from Istanbul. Good evening. 
Good evening. So, Laura, the latest target of the crackdown seems to be once again the journalists, though the Turkish government was under fire even before the coup for restricting press freedoms. Yes, yeah, so 42 arrest, arrest warrants have been issued today for journalists in Turkey. Now, the government says that they are wanted for arrest not because of what they've written, because of criminal connect connections that they have to this cleric, Fethullah Gulen, who is blamed for being behind the coup. Now, some of them work for newspapers that have been linked to his movement, um, but critics say that this is... Um, it's going too far, um, that there's no evidence that these people were behind uh, the plot, and they warn that it's going to create a kind of chilling effect on journalists in this country, um, with self-censorship inevitably following. And, Laura, another target uh, which is being spoken of is, is the foreign influence, ambassadors. Who might be the next target in Turkey? Um, it's hard to know. Uh, the, the, the foreign minister today made clear that uh, some foreign ambassadors could be asked to leave the country. Um, I think it's worth noting that there's, there's very strong uh, hostility, growing hostility here, I would say, to the response from the US, uh, from European countries. There is a sense in Turkey, led from the government and pro-government media, that Turkey had a real near miss last Friday, um, that the president came close to being killed, that civilians were being shot on the streets that the country could easily have plunged into civil war. And they feel that their allies in the West are not taking this threat sufficiently seriously. So we're seeing a lot of negati negativity towards some of those countries. And the state of emergency is indeed being taken to its full extent. Laura Patel, I want to thank you for joining us this evening. Now, while the G20 meets in China amid fear and uncertainty over Brexit, British Prime Minister Theresa May makes her way to Belfast to reassure Northern Ireland about Brexit negotiations. Marking her first visit since becoming Prime Minister, Shelby Weiner has the story. Newly appointed British Prime Minister Theresa May said she does not want to see a return to Ireland's previous borders. On her first trip to Northern Ireland since assuming office, Concern over the border between British-controlled Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic, an EU member, has risen after the UK voted to leave the European Union. Nobody wants to return to the borders of the past. Uh, what we do want to do is to find a way through this that is going to work, deliver a practical solution for everybody. A violent history of Catholic nationalists fighting for a unified Ireland against Protestant Unionists ended in 1998 with the Good Friday Agreement. But the accord has been questioned in the light of the Brexit. And May said that the demarcation of the Irish border would be determined in talks in Brussels. I'm clear that the Northern Ireland executive and the other devolved governments will be involved in our discussions as we set forward the UK position. But we've had constructive talks about the will that we all have to find a way through this, which is in the best interest of Northern Ireland and the best interest of the United Kingdom as a whole. Leaders on both sides of Ireland's border have guaranteed that people and goods will be able to cross freely. May also noted that the UK has had a common travel area with the Irish Republic for nearly 100 years. The precarious situation is likely why 56% of Northern Ireland voted to remain in the European Union. And Northern Ireland commentator Gary Spedding joins us now on the line. Good evening. Good evening. So what kind of welcome is uh, Prime Minister May receiving upon arriving in North I Ireland? Well, I think that for a lot of people, her visit will be reassuring. However, for a large section of uh, both communities, uh, it still leaves uh, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, and people are still very worried about what uh, Brexit means for the future in Northern Ireland. Um, and I think the most important thing to remember is that 55.8% of people who voted in Northern Ireland chose to remain in the European Union. And unlike Scotland, where the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, has made it very clear that she will be championing, championing the, uh, the, the vote in Scotland to remain in the European Union, in Northern Ireland, Arlene Foster, the First Minister in Northern Ireland, has, uh, she was actually on the uh, Leave side. And she's shown a disappointing lack of leadership and a lack of representation uh, in relation to the uh, people who voted remain in Northern Ireland. And uh, you just heard there her, her speech um, talking about peace and stability in Northern Ireland and, and the border. Um, these are issues that were already dealt with in the Good Friday Agreement, which is under jeopardy because of the uh, leaving of the European Union. The, the European Communities Act, for example, is key to the Good Friday Agreement. 
uh, the European, a number of European structures and cross-border institutes are dependent on the European Union and a lot of peace funding is dependent on the European Union. And, and, and Mr. Spedding, is there any chance that Northern Ireland and Scotland would get any special status as they are interested in staying within the Union? Well, that's currently being debated, and there are a number of cases, uh, instances, in fact, where I know uh, people are trying to launch legal challenges in relation to this, and the discussion is still going on. We're not entirely clear about whether Scotland and Northern Ireland will be able to get any kind of special status or not. And Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland is still trying uh, her hardest to uh, promote the idea that she might have a veto over the UK leaving the European Union. Um, but Gary Spedding, I want to thank yeah. you very much for joining us this evening and weighing in on the latest following the Brexit vote. New archaeological discoveries in the north of Israel shed new light on the religious rituals carried out in the name of the half-man, half-goat god Pan. These date back all the way to the first century. More from I-24 News correspondent Uri Shapira. Hippos, the Golan Heights, Israel. This magnificent site above the shores of the Sea of Galilee was once considered as a polis, a city-state which had a political entity starting from the Hellenistic period. It is the only polis from the center of the Golan towards the south of the Golan. So this is a rather large area of taxation, rural area, of course based basically on agriculture. But now new evidence in Hippos shows that perhaps some of the most interesting activities took place on the outskirts of the city. Last year, a group of archaeologists led by Dr. Michael Eisenberg from Haifa University discovered one of the most significant findings of 2015, a large bronze mask of the Greek god Pan. A month ago, the researchers uncovered a Roman gate on the same site, a few miles from the center of the city. Why is this sanctuary, or the cult for Pan, for example, is located outside of the city? It's very simple. They are the goddess of the nature. There is another reason for it, a bit more interesting one. Their cult many times involved in dancing, being drunk, ecstatic dancing, and sometimes even orgies, yes, we know about it. So the elders of the town said, it's very nice of you to worship Pan, but take it outside of the city, please. Another field of interest in the recent excavation focuses on the Roman period and especially on Roman baths, located on the slopes of the mountain. We have this division that we have the cold part and the warm part, and we have the hypocaust system, which is built exactly the same as in other bathhouses on the pillars that are both circular, rectangular. According to Dr. Eisenberg, this site is also significant for Christians, as it mentioned briefly in the New Testament, and contains the ruins of seven ancient churches. But because of some hazards, the road is not open to the wider public and remains, at least for now, far from the tourist trail. And staying in Israel, but moving from the ancient to the new and innovative, Zemingo, the largest app creator in Israel, according to their website, creates the apps of things, apps that turn physical products into connected, reactive, and smart devices. Derived by Internet of Things, AOT transforms products into smart devices. And to tell us about this, we're joined by Robert Prisco, VP Business Development of Zamingo Group. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Good so evening. do tell us about the apps of things. What is it? Okay, so um, this, in the world today, there's, uh, you know, everybody heard, heard about the IoT, the Internet of Things. But I think that the, the, the point that is being missed is the fact that the IoT is all about things that talk with other things. If you'd like, it's, it's sort of a newer iteration of machine to machine. Um, and what we bring into the picture is the interaction of this world of IoT with the end user. And we see a great challenge in the world uh, in transforming a physical product into a connected device, not necessarily from the technological point of view. This has been solved by many solutions out there, but more uh, from the So from how the does this affect the lives of consumers? 
So it's, it exactly touches the consumer because I think one of the, the challenges that, that we see today, the gap in the industry, is that everybody knows how to talk about the technology that enables the, 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 the interaction, but not about the end user. And I can give you know several examples of how it touches the... So do give an example of how it applies. So let's, let's take um, a, more, a very mundane thing like an air conditioner, okay? So everybody knows what an air conditioner is, but... How can a connected air conditioner can can help do our lives, make our lives better? And using the apps of things and thinking about the user, we can ask ourselves questions such as, um, okay, what do we would like our AC to do? For example, how can we chill the car before I enter, for instance? How, how do I chill the car? It's one example. Another example is, you know, if the AC is working for three hours and the temperature hasn't dropped, it can send you a push notification saying, maybe you can check the windows, maybe they are open, for example. So these are a lot of small things that make a difference to us as consumers um, that makes the apps of things. And what's the next step very quickly? Well, I think that the next steps is that more and more consumer companies will, will understand the value to the users and how to engage with this issue of how to provide us with more value. And then we'll see more things that actually help us um, and giving us not only the functionality, but also helping us do things better uh, for us. Robert Prisco, I want to thank you for joining us today and telling us how we're going to make our lives better. We're definitely yeah, going to be following that. And that's all the time we have uh, this evening for the lineup. Do stay with us here at I24 News. Next up, News Now with Mirab Savir. Thank you for watching. Welcome back to the lineup. We're going to look now at a story from the Middle East. Nearly one year after the terror attack on his home in the West Bank village of Duma, five-year-old Ahmed Dawabshe, the sole family survivor from the attack, has finally been released from hospital. Ahmed's parents and one-year-old brother were killed in the fire, which, according to Israeli prosecutors, was started by two Jewish extremists. Our correspondent Mohammed Al Qasim accompanied the family today and brought back this story. Almost one year to the day, the sole survivor of an arson attack that killed his entire family. It's okay for his survival. We were not sure whether he will survive or not. It will take time. This is not the last time that we see him. He will come in very often, all right, for years. The first stage of Ahmed's treatment in the hospital is over, and doctors released him to his grandfather, Hussein Dawabshe. Ahmed is now living in Duma, just a few meters from where his family was murdered. But even though he is now in the comfort of a new home, Ahmed's journey to full recovery may take years. Mohammed Al-Qasim, I-24 News, Tel Hashumir Hospital, Tel Aviv. And Mohammed Al Qasim, who brought us this report, is actually with us in studio. Thank you for joining me. So, Mohammed, let's start with his medical condition today and uh, an expectation for a full recovery. Great progress. I've been with, on this case and this uh, I've reported on it from day one. The because none of them came to visit him during his stay. He says, My mother, father, and brother are in heaven. Ahmed underwent a number of surgeries. He always has on compression shirts almost like a bodysuit, due to the severe burns sustained in the attack. He must also avoid direct sunlight. Ahmed's grandfather, Hussein Dawabshi, spoke highly of the doctors here at Tel HaShomer Hospital, saying the staff treated his grandchild in the best way possible. What happened to Ahmed made him an introvert. He keeps to himself and loves to play games featuring his favorite hero, Cristiano Ronaldo. Dr. Asher Brzezilai, head of the pediatric infectious unit, said when Ahmed arrived here, his condition was critical. When he comes here, he was in 60 degrees burns. Usually those kids do not survive. And actually we have to fight for the first month. Ahmed Dawabshi was released from the hospital last Friday and is among family now. The firebomb attack, allegedly committed by an extremist Jewish group, killed his mother, father and brother. Ahmed, who turned six this week, spent his first few days in Duma with his grandparents. His uncle Nasser said, 
coming home helps in his nephew's treatment. Thank God Ahmad is in good spirits. He wanted to come home and doesn't want to stay in the hospital. One full year is enough away from his village and relatives. Being here will help speed up Ahmed's treatment. Ahmed suffered burns on more than 60% of his tiny body. He spent close to a month in the intensive care unit. When he came home, he asked about his parents and his little brother Ali. Yes, we talked with Ahmed, but before we told him, we had a feeling something happened. Great progression that Ahmed's made in the last year uh, gives you, uh, according to his doctors, uh, basically he will recover. It may take years. Some doctors said that it may take up to eight years with, uh, with, by, with treatment before he is fully recovering. But to see him walk again, which a few months ago he couldn't even walk and put any pressure on his feet or his body, it's a great, great uh, uh, thing to, to hear and see. Uh, he's back to his uh, natural environment. He's back to seeing his friends and his family, and he feels a lot better now. His spirit is very high and his self-esteem is great. And I think that being at home will impact him very, very positively. And the doctors mentioned that for the first month, they're really fighting for his life. And though he's been released, he will be seeing the hospital on a very, uh, uh, on a regular occasion yes, every yes. week. What, what's expected as far as his recovery and visiting the hospital? He will be visiting the hospital.